the tapestry of John Cabot's life, woven in the vibrant hues of the 15th century, unfolds against the backdrop of the Serenissima Republic of Venice. Born around 1450, the son of a spice merchant named Giulio Cabotto, young Giovanni Cabotto, the Venetian appellation that would later anglicize to John Cabot, imbibed the eclectic spirit of Venice, a city pulsating with the vibrancy of trade and cultural exchange. Venice, the queen of the Adriatic, nurtured Cabot amidst its labyrinthine canals and opulent palaces. The city's rich maritime tradition, coupled with the constant influx of goods from the east, painted a vivid backdrop for the impressionable Giovanni. Growing up amid the scent of exotic spices and the chatter of diverse languages, Cabot's formative years were steeped in the mystique of distant lands, laying the foundations for his later obsession with finding a westward route to Asia. As a youth, Cabot likely received an education that encompassed not only the mercantile arts, but also the rudiments of navigation. Venice, a maritime powerhouse, valued the skills needed to navigate the intricate waterways of the Mediterranean, fostering a generation of adept seafarers. Cabot, eager to expand his horizons, set sail from Venice, venturing into the broader currents of the maritime world. In the late 1480s, John Cabot found himself entangled in financial woes in Venice, eventually leaving as an insolvent debtor by the 5th of November 1488. Seeking refuge in Valencia, Spain, creditors pursued him with a letter of recommendation to justice. In Valencia, under the alias John Cabot Montecalunya, he proposed harbour improvements, met rejection, and then moved to Seville in early 1494. There, Cabot secured a contract to build a stone bridge over the Guadalquivir River, but the project collapsed in December 1494. Undeterred, Cabot continued his quest for Atlantic exploration support, journeying through Seville, Lisbon, and eventually arriving in London around mid-1495. Cabot's arrival in the British Isles marked the inception of a daring venture, an expedition fueled by ambition and the tantalizing promise of untold riches in the discovery of a northwest passage to Asia. As he stepped onto the pebbled shores, the salty sea breeze weaving through his hair, Cabot embarked on a journey that would forever alter the course of exploration. In the bustling taverns and courtly circles of late 15th century England, Cabot found himself entangled in a web of intrigue and royal favor. With the diplomatic finesse of a seasoned mariner, he sought the patronage of none other than King Henry VII, the shrewd and calculating monarch of the burgeoning Tudor dynasty. Henry, with an eye fixed on the bounties of direct trade with Asia, saw in Cabot a conduit to rival the exploits of Spain and Portugal. With the ink still wet on a royal charter, Cabot returned to Bristol, a bustling port city on the western fringes of Europe. Bristol, with its shipbuilders and maritime enterprises, offered fertile ground for Cabot's burgeoning ambitions. The convergence of seafaring expertise and the allure of uncharted territories drew Cabot to this maritime enclave, where he would soon carve his name into the annals of exploration. The finances of his inaugural expedition were a delicate dance of courtly influence and economic maneuvering. With letters patent from the English crown secured, Cabot, ever resourceful, sought financial support from a consortium of merchants eager to reap the dividends of overseas trade with Asia. The consortium included influential Italian bankers operating in London. And so with the coffers filled and the winds favorable, John Cabot embarked on his maiden voyage in the summer of 1496. His vessel cutting through the Atlantic swell like a dagger through velvet. The crew, a motley assembly of sailors and dreamers, sailed under the banner of the English crown, their hearts afire with the prospect of discovery. Little is recorded of this first voyage, and it is assumed that facing difficulties in the Atlantic, his single vessel, the Matthew, returned to the shores of England. In the spring of 1497, Cabot once again set sail from Bristol aboard his diminutive vessel, the Matthew of Bristol, a vessel of only 50 tons burden laden with supplies sufficient for a perilous journey lasting seven or eight months. His crew, 
a motley band of fewer than two dozen men, included an enigmatic Burgundian and a Genoese barber, who likely doubled as the ship's surgeon, a profession in that era embracing not only the art of barbering, but also the delicate domains of dentistry and minor surgery. A veil of mystery shrouded Cabot's second expedition, with evidence emerging in the late 20th century, suggesting the involvement of two prominent Bristol merchants, one being William Weston. The journey, guided by the elusive currents of the Atlantic, took Cabot and his crew past Ireland, unveiling a continent unknown to Europeans. On June 24, 1497, they made landfall on the coast of North America, the exact location a subject of historical contention. The John Day letter, discovered in the 1950s, hinted at Newfoundland, or nearby Cape Breton Island, as the probable initial landing points, tracing a coastline between Bordeaux, France, and Dursay Head in Southern Ireland. Cabot's exploration was marked by cautious diplomacy, landing only once, just within the musket's range, and avoiding contact with native inhabitants. Raising the Venetian and Papal banners, the crew claimed the newfound land for the English crown and acknowledged the religious authority of the Roman Catholic Church. Upon his return to Bristol, Cabot rode to London to regale the monarch with tales of discovery. The king, perhaps preoccupied with the second Cornish uprising of 1497, rewarded Cabot with 10 pounds in August 1497. It was a fleeting triumph, overshadowed by the tumult of the times. Yet as Henry's throne steadied, Cabot found favour once again, receiving a pension of £20 per year, retroactively granted from March 1497. The bureaucratic tussles over Bristol's customs payments added a layer of complexity, but on February 3rd, 1498, Cabot was granted new letters patent, preparing the way for another audacious expedition a sequel to a chapter in the Annals of Maritime Exploration that had only just begun. In the Annals of Exploration, the tale of John Cabot's third and final odyssey stands as a saga shrouded in mystery and maritime daring. Departing from Bristol in May 1498, Cabot led a formidable fleet of five ships, one commissioned by the king himself. Laden with a curious cargo of merchandise, cloth, caps, lace points, and assorted trifles, the expedition hinted at a dual mission of exploration and trade. News from the Spanish envoy in London spoke of a tempestuous setback, with one ship forced to seek refuge in Ireland while Cabot and the remaining vessels pressed forward. The narrative then veiled itself in silence, leaving historians to wonder whether the intrepid navigator met his fate at sea or ventured into uncharted realms, perhaps choosing to dwell among the indigenous people echoing the enigmatic destiny of Etienne Brulé. Olwyn Ruddock, a scholar immersed in Cabot's era, proposed a bold thesis. She posited that Cabot and his fleet triumphantly returned to England in the spring of 1500, after an epic two-year exploration, penetrating the east coast of North America, reaching as far south as the Chesapeake Bay, and potentially venturing into the Spanish territories of the Caribbean. Ruddock's evidence including the renowned map by Spanish cartographer Juan de la Cosa, seemed to support this audacious claim. Rudok's narrative spun further intrigue, suggesting that Giovanni Antonio de Carbonaris, a friar on the 1498 expedition, may have founded a mission in Newfoundland, marking the first Christian settlement on the continent since the Norse era. Yet the final chapters of Cabot's epic tale remain elusive entangled in the threads of time and exploration. As the winds of exploration continued to buffet the sails of English vessels, the reign of Henry VII witnessed a succession of maritime forays that etched the name of England upon the map of the New World. The tapestry of these early expeditions, woven with ambition and royal patronage, unveiled a saga of daring navigators, royal largesse, and the birth of organized efforts to fathom the enigmatic realms beyond the Atlantic. With William Weston's expedition to the newfound land in 1499 or 1500, Weston became the first Englishman to command the exploration of North America. King Henry VII, recognizing the magnitude of this enterprise, rewarded Weston with 30 pounds for his expenses about the finding of the new land, 
underscoring the royal commitment to these audacious endeavors. Henry VII's support endured, manifesting in the generous grant of 20 pounds to Hugh Elliot, Robert Thorne, and Thorne's son in January 1502. This sum fueled the acquisition of the Gabriel, a vessel destined for a summer expedition. A subsequent reward of 100 pounds, a princely sum in the annals of exploration, acknowledged Elliot's exploits in two ships to the Isle of New Finding, the original name bestowed upon Newfoundland. Around this time, the intrepid explorers of Bristol formalized their efforts with the establishment of a company, christened the Company Adventurers to the New Found Land. Armed with letters patent, this consortium orchestrated further expeditions in 1503 and 1504, solidifying Bristol's status as a crucible of new world exploration. In 1508, the stage shifted to the scion of exploration, Sebastian Cabot, John's son, who embarked on a final voyage to North America from Bristol. Navigating a section of coast spanning from the Hudson Bay to Chesapeake Bay, Sebastian carved his own chapter in the Chronicles of Exploration. However, upon his return in 1509, the explorer faced a disheartening revelation, the demise of his royal sponsor, Henry VII, and the ascent of a new monarch, Henry VIII, whose gaze turned elsewhere, leaving westward exploration in the shadows. These early English expeditions, propelled by the patronage of Henry VII and the resolve of intrepid navigators, laid the foundation for subsequent voyages that would further unravel the mysteries of the New World, marking a pivotal chapter in the annals of maritime exploration and the inexorable rise of England as a seafaring power. Thank you for embarking on this insightful journey through history. If this brief yet enriching historical summary has kindled your curiosity, we extend an invitation to like and subscribe to our channel.